you know, by the time we were set and done, something that can be done in as little as three weeks here took uh, six weeks. And, it, you know, it was just because I uh, didn't follow good protocol. Best ever listeners, before we get into today's episode, I want to mention Trevor McGregor. Trevor is a real estate results coach. I've been paying him and working with him for years now. He actually is responsible for giving me the idea to do a podcast. So it's not only about transactions that he gives advice on how to find more deals, how to make more money, but also how to build a holistic plan around your real estate entrepreneurship endeavors. That's what I love about working with Trevor, that and being held accountable for what I say I'm going to do and actually making sure that I follow through and do it. I feel like I'm a pretty results-oriented, accountable kind of person, but it's always nice to have someone who's there guiding you along the way and giving you strategy as well as psychology tips for how to deal with you know the things that come up as a real estate entrepreneur. Trevor has made a wonderful offer for the best ever listeners, and that is that he's offering a free coaching session Go to coachwithtrevor.com. That's C O A C H W I T H T R E V O R.com. Highly recommend them. I've worked with them before. I'm currently working with them right now as my business, as my real estate investing coach. Highly recommend you do the same. Take them up on his offer. Get a free coaching session. Coachwithtrevor.com. Best ever listeners, welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Joe Fairless and well, I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. This is Saturday, so we're doing a special segment of the show titled Situation Saturday where we're putting our best ever guests in a sticky situation that they've been in in the past and they're going to talk us through, they're going to tell us a story of how they overcame that sticky situation. With us today, we have a previous best ever guest. If you want to know his best ever advice, then go to episode number 33, way, way back, 33, and the episode's titled, Using All Sorts of Financing to Build Your Empire. How you doing, Bill Schaefer? I'm doing great. It's a wonderful day, beautiful sunshine here, and uh, couldn't be happier. All right. Well, that's because you're in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, and there is no such <laughs> sunshine to be to be had. I, I think the closest sunshine is uh, maybe maybe you actually. <laughs> maybe Denver, Colorado, is the closest place of sunshine. Yeah. A, a little bit about Bill, and then we'll get into Situation Saturday. So, if you look back in the bio for Bill on episode 33. It's going to say that he and his wife own 10 properties with 22 units in Colorado and Wyoming. Fast forward to today, episode 500 and something. I'm not exactly sure what episode this is, but 500 and something. And now his bio is he owns 14 properties with 36 units. So he's picked up two properties and uh, quick math, 14 units. There's been a lot going on since the last time we spoke to him. Uh, He and his wife are buy and hold investors. They buy in Colorado. His properties range from single family homes to as large as an eight unit. Uh, They are, they've been investing since 2002 and he's got, he's a real estate agent and he's got a brokerage called Reliant Real Estate. Now, with that being said, Bill, you want to give the best ever listeners really quickly a little bit about you, and then we'll get into it. Sure. So the kind of the growth from, I mean, if you want the longer story, go back to last time and do that. But since then, um, I started, uh, I was going to be a wholesaler and did some direct mail marketing. And uh, that has kind of led me to the acquisitions that have grown my business in this past year and did, you know, again, a variety of options. I actually sold the property in Wyoming, so we're totally out of that, which was a painful lesson. But that's another day, another story. And then um, picked up some more here in Denver, and it's been good. And with the acquisitions has come a little pain. It's kind of what our topic is today with the evictions. <laughs> but, I, you know, I buy as is, where is, and tenants in place and you know, of course, uh, there's some some growing pains that go with that, and uh, I've got some 
lessons to go along the eviction route. All right. Well, boy, if, if we could count the um, the the number of negative words as far as pain and evictions <laughs> that you mentioned in those last like six sentences, you said pain at least three times, and I think evictions at least twice. Yeah. So we, we're we're definitely going to uh, get the story behind that when. At the end of our conversation today, what will the best ever listeners acquire in order to help them with their real estate investing? Sure. So I think the, the, the best advice ever is something that I've heard on your show a number of times is to kind of begin with the end in mind. And so what the, this, our discussion will do is kind of outline some things so that the words that I used, pain and eviction, would be either less painful or not at all and, you know, not having evictions to deal with um, part of what, you know, I managed for 12, 13 years with no evictions. And then, you know, the recent acquisitions have been the source of that, which I knew going in and it was part of the process. And nonetheless, it still has some lessons in it for folks. So that's kind of right. where I love it. So so let let's get into it. Sure. What, tell us the story behind behind what you're what you're talking about. Okay. Well, I guess the first thing is I'm not an attorney and I don't play one on TV or the internet. And so I don't have legal advice. It, what you know, what I wanted to offer is just a perspective for property managers or, you know, people managing their own property or people with other people managing their property, just a framework to look at the eviction process or the lack thereof that, you know, would help to avoid that pain. Okay. So this year, um, pro- the one that went all the way through, I've had a number that have, uh, you know, come out of the process somewhere along the way, but the one that went all the way through was a house I purchased from a lady, you know, she'd rented to an acquaintance. Um, she didn't really, uh, check her background or her ability to pay. And she was made, she had, she was 86 years old, a grandmother, great grandmother probably. And she had, you know, she had a a meager income of like 2,600 a month from a pension or something. And she was paying 1350 in rent and market rent. I've got the place rented now for 2000 a month. So, you know, when I, when I got it, I, you know, the, the first landlord, you know, made the mistake renting to somebody they had a relationship with and she just wanted out. And so she sold it to me for a good price. And, but then it was my job to move the lady on in life. And I didn't really realize what, I mean, she didn't have any qualification, you know, no background on her or anything like that. So I was kind of going in blind, but I learned as we went through the process, what was, you know, her, how much she actually had in income. She had an adult daughter living with her that was, you know, not, didn't have a job and, you know, wasn't contributing to anything. And, you know, that's another red flag as you do screening, but what ended up happening was um, we, t- to kind of make the long story short, is uh, I, you know, I it was a couple of, she said she was going to move and she didn't move. And then, uh, you know, I gave her, you know, you're going to have to move kind of thing. And finally, uh, you know, a week or so into it, I posted the notice. And then, you know, we had the uh, holiday and it, you know, it pushed it back some more. And then the I had the, hired the attorney and there was a little communication, you know, lag there. And, you know, by the time we were said and done, something that can be done in as little as three weeks here took uh, six weeks. And, it, you know, it was just because I uh, didn't follow good protocol, uh, you know, as far as managing the situation. And so kind of the advice that I have for people is, you know, again, begin with the end in mind have a written policy of when you're going to file for an eviction, you know, when you're going to post your notice, when you're going to file for eviction, you know, all of that needs to be down in writing and not, and don't deviate from it. You know, you get a story from a tenant, oh, well, I'm going to get paid on Friday, you know, and it's Tuesday and it's like, well, what's another three days? And then, you know, they don't pay and you're already, so then you got to post your notice on the weekend and it drags it out. So it's a, it's a process that takes, you know, time and, you know, figure out your daily rent, whatever that is. You know, if you're renting a place for 900 a month, it's $30 a day every day that you sit on, you know, that you're hoping that they'll pay that you're potentially losing. So 
another thing, something that I did right with this lady was I, you know, I communicated with her ahead of time when it was kind of evident that she wasn't going to be able to pay. I sent her uh, kind of my kind of standard move out thing that says, hey, if you, you know, are unable to find a place, you still have to leave. You know, it, it spells out, gives them an option, says, you know, rent a storage unit, stay with friends, you know, do something like that. And that's what she ended up doing. I mean, she uh, filed for bankruptcy part way through it. And fortunately, I didn't get drug into that because my attorney, you know, kind of helped me out with that process. But it, it, it it's a very, you know, people don't think well in those stressful situations. So if you give them a path to go, that helps them you know, figure that out ahead of time. You know, you cannot, I could have offered her cash for keys, but it would have been, you know, she had, she was a hoarder. She, you know, this house was, they filled two storage units with the, you know, with her stuff. And then we had a whole nother truck that we took out the day that we actually physically evicted her with it. So, um, you know, the, the other thing is, uh, know your local laws, you know, no, I mean, every, there's not probably, there's no part of law that's more local than evictions. Every place, even in, you know, Colorado has state statutes, but each municipality has the ability to come in and make its own laws. Boulder has its laws, you know, each, uh, it differs from Denver, you know, Denver County has different laws than Jefferson County, you know, court date, you can go in any day in Denver and Jefferson County, there's only a couple days a week that they see eviction stuff. So all you just got to know what it is. And I think the best real estate investing advice ever that I would offer is go visit the court of your local jurisdiction. Just go when you don't have a case, find out when they, sh when they do evictions, you know, when they actually, have the the court in session and go sit there and watch you know how the judges handle it i mean in in my area it's more like judge judy than you know law and order it's i this i had another eviction that i was taking the lady she wasn't making payments and she actually didn't show up to the court date so i won by default i had two days later i could get the writ i was you know on my way down to get the writ and the and the bailiff calls and says, oh, you got to come back to court on Tuesday because uh, the lady, she made up an excuse for why she didn't get to court. And they, you know, had compassion or whatever on her. And I had to go back to court. You know, the other thing is, you know, court is a wild card. You, you don't, you know, judges are likely to split the baby. So if you're in there, you've got a tent and it's not paying. If they show up, the judge is likely to say, you know, I'll give you another 30 days to move because he makes some story up. You still get your possession, but you don't, you know, it, you lose another month's rent. So negotiate with them. Like the the one lady that showed up late and we had to go back to court, she owed me like 600 bucks in back rent so and fees and stuff. So I, I sat down with her before we went to the judge and she agreed to pay five. I asked her what she wanted to pay and she said I'd pay 550. So I agreed with that and we got that stipulated with the court and I got the court to agree that I wouldn't have to reinitiate the eviction process if she didn't pay. I could just come in and, you know, not all courts allow that. But if you know the laws of where you are, then you can do those little things. An attorney might or might not, you know, know to do that. So you want to pick an attorney that does a lot of it. Attorneys have a number of advantages locally, you know, they can file online, whereas I have to truck down there and, you know, pay my ninety seven dollars. Um, they have a lot of experience, but eviction law is not a huge uh, area of practice. So like I use the biggest firm in Denver for that. And they, you know, the attorneys that I talk to are just right out of law school, maybe a year or two. And. You know, they're not the sharpest, you know, they're not going to be the corporate lawyers or whatever. But so but the firm has, you know, they have policies, they have a process, they know how the system works, they know the judges. So, you know, if you're starting out and have never done one, um, I would definitely advise you get and especially if you have an eviction that's not a standard process. You know, the slam dunk is if they haven't paid rent. 
or if you've given notice to move, at least here in Denver. I know other places, you know, you can't move them out, like, you know, places with rent control and stuff like that. But, you know, if you have a bulletproof lease that offers, you know, that makes the tenant keep the grass two inches tall and all this kind of stuff. If you if I took that into court because they were letting the grass grow to four inches when the code is six inches, the judge would laugh at me and tell them to cut the grass and, you know, I'd have to be back to square one. So you kind of have to know what, you know, what goes on and what's possible there. How much did it cost you to work with the attorneys? So it was a little bit unique. It wasn't a slam dunk because like I said, she did file uh, for bankruptcy in the middle. Now she could have drugged me into that process and it would have taken longer to gotten pulled. I didn't want any money from her. I just wanted the property. So there was no money issue. And so her her lawyer didn't really, I don't know whether he didn't understand or what. I mean, he they could have drugged me into it, but they stipulated it and they signed an agreement with us that I gave him another eight days to uh, um, to get out. And she didn't make that. And then, you know, the, another mistake I made was I didn't, you know, I believed her too many times. It, she, So I should have, when I got the writ from the sheriff and the sheriff was and I got on the sheriff's schedule, I should have gone to the movers. Uh, right here in Denver, we have two hours to move them out. She had a four bedroom, two bath house and a three, a two and a half car. Well, really a three car garage stuffed to the gills with stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I should have had the movers lined up the day that, you know, for the for the day that she said she was going to be out. And I had, you know, would have been on the share. I was on the sheriff's schedule for the day after that. So if I could have had all that lined up, then it would have saved me about two weeks of time because I didn't have movers. And so I had to call the sheriff when she wasn't out and say, you know, get on their schedule again. And it was about a week and a half out. And I had to hire, you know, movers that would be there to do it. So and then, you know, then I talked with the sheriff and he's like, well, with that much stuff, we'd have probably just come and looked in the door and had you reschedule in two weeks or something. You know, so it because they that you you know, you can't put the stuff in the street. So what you have to do on what they said you had to do in that case was, you know, bring a dumpster and get a permit from the city to put it on the curb. And so we would have had to put all of our stuff in the dumpster and we would have had to have two, probably 40, 30 yard dumpsters to fit all of our stuff. But, you know, and then I would have been looking at thousands of dollars worth of, you know, labor from the moving company to do that. So it kind of, the two weeks of rent traded off for the moving company being, you know, having to pay them to move her stuff. She worked for two weeks and moved when I didn't have to. So lots, lots of lessons learned on the eviction process. Yep. And, and it, the inspiration for you to have this conversation is uh, with us is that instead of six weeks, instead of three weeks, on the eviction process, it took you six weeks. So you could have sliced your time in half, which is almost a full month's rent. Right? Yeah. And, you know, the other other things, I mean, the other evictions that I've started, but like the one lady paid up or whatever, you know, being on top of it is a huge thing. I mean, you know, the I, I, newbies, I don't know where it comes in. I guess it's from mortgages or whatnot, but people have grace periods in their lease, you know. I have no grace in my lease, period. You know, the rent is due the first. If they don't pay me when it's due, they get a notice the next day. And, the, you know, some people, well, they'll have daily late fees, which in a lot of places, they, judges don't allow. I mean, tenants pay it even though they may not allow it. But Or they have a big late fee and they like collecting that, you know, when they're 10 days late or whatever, they'll get an extra 100 bucks. But I think that practice actually – is self-defeating. You know, you get somebody that does a uh, 10 day, you know, 10 days in and they don't, they get their late fee sometime, but then that means that they're, you know, at $30 a day, they've already lost $300 worth of rent. If that person doesn't, you know, if they post it the day that their late fees, you know, would have come in or whatever. So it's just a, uh, I think the management practice you want is to manage for no late 
And if you get a late fee, that kind of covers your costs of dealing with, you know, send them a, rent, a reminder or whatever, or post in the notice. I mean, some people even charge people to post the notice, uh, you know, a, a fee for that. They have that in the lease as well. So, it, you know, that's the, you, you just have to stay, you know, get your policy, stay with your policy. You, you know, it's so many times you get a sob story and it drags out for 30, 60 days. You know, you see people post on line about, you know, oh, my tenant's two months behind. And you get that way because they nibble, you know, they don't come in. Nobody, no tenant comes to you and says, oh, well, would it be okay if I paid, you know, in two months? No, you'd never do that. But it, it goes a week late and then it's 12 days late and 15 days late and then 20 days late. And then you're afraid if you tell it, you know, if you start the eviction process, they'll move out and you've lost, you know, so it just kind of snowballs. And that's what the, you know, those are where you get the big costs in an eviction is when you don't start the process as soon as you're legally allowed. Some places don't require payment until, you know, five or 10 days, but you can still post a notice when it's not due. I mean, you just can't charge them any late fees or whatever, but you can still start the process sooner. So again, you have to know what you can, you know, what the options are from a legal standpoint. You know, there's uh, something you need to do also is assess your tenant. You know, there's some tenants that you, there's no way that you want to mess with them. You just hire a lawyer and some people, you know, they like the hands-on management, so maybe they do it themselves. But if you've got somebody that has demonstrated knowledge of the law or whatever, don't try and do it yourself. If you, you know, I've seen it, if a landlord gets in front of a judge and doesn't ha know exactly what to do, the judges just crucify him. I mean, they, they lose so many different ways. And, uh, you know, that, you know, people say, well, I don't have the money to hire a lawyer. But if you get in front of a judge and you did something wrong, like you didn't give notice right or, you know, they weren't served properly and you got to start the process over, you've, you know, it's a standard eviction you asked earlier was about 450 if they don't. At least that was the that's that my particular attorney's standard rate. And that's if they don't contest it or anything, which most probably 90 percent of evictions aren't contested. And of those 10 percent that are, you know, less than five percent of those are people that really have a standing. You know, most of the time the tenants lose pretty much hands down and. Most of them, you know, if you file an eviction, most don't even show up in court because they know they owe money. They'll, you know, skip out. And it's just kind of a formality. So you don't have to abandon the get abandonment on the property or whatnot. But yep, that, and that's that's been my experience, too. As far as the pricing goes, it uh, when when you have a larger property that costs and, and depends on your market, too. But that cost could go down. I've seen as low as one hundred and fifty dollars, sure, uh, to to handle it all, and it just yeah. you know, it depends on um, absolutely um, and you, a couple different factors. Well, I mean, the attorneys don't really have a lot of overhead. They've got you know a clerk that files it on the computer via the internet, and your filing fee is in my court is a, a roughly a hundred bucks. So you know their real costs are probably somewhere around fifteen minutes of a clerk's time, which is you know probably 10 bucks or something. So, you know, but they're there. I mean, they're the backstop. If things go bad, you've got, you know, representation. They know what's in, they know your lease, they know, um, you know, that's why you have them there is not for when everything goes right. It's when everything goes bad. Well, Bill, thank you for sharing the framework and the lessons you've learned on the eviction process. I've been writing as you've been talking the 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 thing that stands out for me is let's just have a written policy for the eviction process so if if we don't have one right now and we own property and we manage it ourselves or if we have a property management company then we've got to have a written policy already in place if we don't then let's do it right now of filing the eviction and how to how to approach that and that way, when you're speaking to your residents and eviction time comes, hopefully it doesn't, but it will at some point, 
then you know exactly what to follow and you can blame it on the process not the yeah. uh, not your cold heart yeah. uh, whenever whenever the story comes up then you you also mentioned give them a path talk to them about the solutions that they have in place while still referencing your process or your policy uh, the other is know your local laws certainly uh, as as you mentioned State statutes, even the uh, municipality laws, are are very uh, varied. So we, we've got to know um, that. And it's funny you, you mentioned the Judge Judy reference. It's I, I've sat in on and participated in, in eviction proceedings with uh, some of some of some residents for apartment communities of mine, and uh, just to learn the process a little bit more and see it firsthand. And you are right. It is totally Judge Judy versus Law, law and Order. That's for sure. You hear all sorts of uh, colorful stories. And fortunately, in the, the locations I'm at, the judge is heavily towards the landlord versus the, the, the tenant. Uh, and that's another thing we've, we've got to take into account. What are the, uh, the laws in the state, I know I mentioned that, but it's really important, the state laws and where, what do they typically favor. So thank you for sharing this with the best ever listeners and myself, talking through the framework for the eviction process. Uh, great having you on the show again, my friend, right. and uh, looking forward to continuing to see this uh, bio be updated in a positive way. It keeps increasing. Um, hope you have a best ever weekend. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you, Joe. Did you achieve all your real estate goals in 2015? Well, if you did, congratulations. Fist bump to you. If you didn't, then go to coachwithtrevor.com. Trevor McGregor is my business coach, my real estate coach. He's also been a guest on the show, episode 320. He is offering a free coaching session for the best ever listeners. Just go to coachwithtrevor.com and it'll help you to achieve your real estate goals in 2016. Do you want to make your investment analysis a breeze while making it look like you spent all week working on it? Then go to getrefm.com forward slash valuate. That's getrefm.com forward slash V-A-L-U-A-T-E. This is Bruce Kirsch's company. He's the best ever guest from episode 128. The episode's titled Crash Course on Financial Modeling for Real Estate Investing. Go to his company's website, Get the software. You can try it out for free. It's a no-brainer. Get refm.com forward slash valuate.